Hi, gang. Um, let's start up with uh, dryer designs. Okay. Uh, over here. Dryer design module two of this. Anyway, uh, again, there's indirect dryers, direct dryers. We're doing direct dryers. Okay. Typically, you have a full range of conditions. Dryer selection is based upon solids handling. The drying is actually relatively easy compared to solids handling. Um, solids handling is the product of powder or is it a preformed shape? Can the product withstand attrition? Are there any size shape limitations? How does the dryer move the material? Solids are often the product or handling is very important and handling is very important. Stationary on the tray to turbulent conveying, exposure times could be from milliseconds to hours. Basically gas liquid contacting, not much air to fluidize or to transport. Anyway, not much air is, is needed. Anyway, so let's take a look. Designs typically may take six to 12 months to do, or they could come off the shelf, depending upon your viewpoint. Uh, over design, uh, some people think over design is not useful, other people think over design is useful. Might be useful in heat loads or fan capacities. It adds flexibility to the design. All designers have practical limits on size, cost, and operating conditions. Limited exposure times exist. All have temperature limits. Direct dryers have gas or air limits. All dryers have safety and environmental concerns. Moving towards higher safety, lower environmental concerns, and less energy usage. Cost of the equipment, installation, operation, operating costs, uh, mainly energy and also labor. It's expensive to evaporate water. Well, that may be true 10 years ago when natural gas was 10 times as expensive as it is now. Now the costs are somewhat or considerably less in the evaporating water. So this may not uh, necessarily hold as it used to in the past. You of course want to avoid downtime. You wish to have reliable equipment. So reliability is very important. Unloading, loading, cleaning, labor times high. Anyway, some of this we may have already mentioned. Air costs, major use. Our major factor in operations, keep air minimum, air use to a minimum, keep costs down. Used to dry, used to dry solid suspend transport perhaps. Cost is air handling equipment, product, uh, product collection equipment, exhaust heating systems can be excessive. excessive. Obnoxious gases, the atmosphere is not permitted, so you may have a burning operation going on. Turn it off. Lots of quality out the stack, very important question. Are you losing taste, flavor, and aroma if they go out the stack? Hot air can damage product or some products or some other product. Basic design, basically temperature and exposure time. How hot and how long? Basically, both are used to control drying. Temperature limits set by the tolerance of the product to the heat, to heat. Very important in design, need to find by testing, find out by testing. Exposure time is also set by the product tolerance and by the equipment. I again, need to find by testing. Temperature limits can be set by equipment exposure limits. Equipment can only take a certain temperature limit. Uh, Corrosion limits, right? Corrosion limits of the machine, corrosion limits of the material, perhaps. Except for areas around incoming air, direct dryers have temperatures around the wet bulb temperature due to evaporative cooling. Useful in drying heat sensitive materials. Vacuum drying is very useful. Direct dryers, simplest dryer once through comes out, you gotta worry about the heater, duct work delivers the heated air. You're looking for good contact in between the material, the air and the material. 
product collectors, separators, and air cleaning may be quite necessary. Heated air lost most of its heat and gained moisture. Air will carry the solids. Air may, air stream or gas stream may carry the solids off. These solids may have to be removed. Air is no longer as hot as it was and is discharged. Partial recycle, total recycle is also possible. So you have heater blowers, solid feeders, drying chamber, product collectors and exit blowers and connecting ductwork plus controls. You can have additional features, simple to complex, lots of design variations out there, additional add-ons, you might try inlet air filters, you might try staged product collectors like cyclones, usually the first cyclones taking out most of the problem, and you follow it with <clears throat> scrubbers, electrostatic precipitators, bag houses, or stage classifiers. You may be very concerned about safety and safety sequencing. Uh, heat removal, heat recovery, and reuse is possible. Two blowers, push-pull fashion, good idea. Again, you got increased equipment usually means increased performance, but higher capital costs. Systems for final product or feed conditioning. Back mixing product with feed improves handling, perhaps. Back mixing descent depends upon the desire to finally moisture, final moisture content. Mixing forward may help uh, product retain properties lost in drying. Exhaust treatment may be interesting. Uh, self inertizing recycle streams, of course, are important. Uh, removal of oxygen. Oxygen is not your friend in processing. Oxygen may change your product. And of course, uh, coarse material may be recycled for further drying. Uh, feed differences, feeders and feeding requirements. Feed may vary all over the map. Wet solids to wet slurries. Back uh, mixing helps, it may help improve acceptable handling properties. Uh, feed forward may help quality to, qualities to the product may help provide qualities for the product. All sorts of feeders, feeder method sometimes determines the success of the operation. Very important to avoid maldistribution of the feed, a need to feed at the lowest moisture level possible. Again, you may have a dewatering device ahead of your dryer, take out a lot of the water that way. Simple uh, allowing the uh, feed to drain would be also a way to uh, remove moisture. Important to minimize drying requirements. For wet uh, solids, screw conveyors, radiating discs, vibratory trays, air rotary airlocks are often used for liquids. You're looking for spray nozzles, wheels, discs. For very wet solids, uh, may need pretreatment to remove moisture. Sticky solids may require back, back, uh, back mixing. Conveyor dryers require feed to be spread, the, uni, spread uniformly across the belt. Special feeders for wide belts. Slingers spread the material in uniform matter. Uh, assuming the slingers actually work. Uh, just because the slinger is rotating, which is highly likely, doesn't mean that there isn't any buildup on the uh, on the wheel or on the slinging device. So you may have to periodically clean your slingers. Uh, mixing type feeders for back mixing are important. It's also important to minimize recycle. Large recycles mean large dryers and you don't want a large dryer. Recycle and self inertizing the CO2 and water, right? You want to reduce the O2 requirements in the dryer. 10% oxygen in the X is typical. Total moisture may be from the feed, from the combustion products, and also from leaks into the dryer. Water is removed from the dryer, it's removed by air from the dryer and exhausted the atmosphere. 
Other recycled strings may contain particles or powder. Incinerator, incineration common practice to treat exhaust of noxious gases and powder. Standard to burn it off. Use a combination of heaters and standby heating capacity, spot heaters, increase the efficiency, Let's add the complications and expense. Intermittent operations are not, are not desirable. Temperature limits, I think we've gone through those. Most materials have a temperature limit or threshold. Degradation occurs above this limit. Metal designs are fixed by temperature strength relationships. Upper limit for air uh, stainless steel is 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Some product, uh, products do not have upper temperature limits. Energy cost, heat is costly. Wasteful practices increase cost. Losses may vary uh, uh, with drier design type of fuel and delivery. Again, going into drier design, I guess this is where we may have left off yesterday. Okay. Well, we'll just go back up. Maybe I missed some of this stuff. Sorry. Not quite sure where I was here. There, were, uh, there we go. Lots of ways to move materials around. Uh, up here again. Uh, 35 to 55% of exhaust heat can be recovered. It's realistic. Anyway, uh, air motion is very greatly. It's one of the reasons why you talk to a dryer company is to understand how they move their air around. That's very important, or how they move their gas around. It's one of the major reasons why you talk to spray dryer companies is to understand how or how they move air inside their spray chambers. Okay. Plus the fact that they have a lot of experience. Drying chambers designed to meet desired air and flow patterns. Required structural requirements, uh, sheet metal chambers reduce thermal expansion, stainless steel for corrosion resistance. Anyway, I think we left there. Uh, air leakage, you can expect 30% air leakage. Okay, however, you could potentially make it airtight. But if you're, you know, 30% air leakage is not abnormal. Keep solids in, minimize powder escape. Leaks of feeders are the, probably the most serious part. Push, push pull rearrangement on blowers. Um, push pull has a zero pressure point. This may be a, way, a, a place where you would enter your dryer. Helps in maintenance, but samples to be taken, equipment to be opened, perhaps. Final moisture content. Obviously, this is one of the major reasons why you're drying. Right? Influences bulk density, ability to flow, degree of hydration, color, etc. High moisture content lets you sell water. Final moisture content needs to be in specs. Anyway, bulk density, very important. My coffee uh, experiment on bulk density. Ground coffee, half full, rotate the record its level, we're now rotate it. Note the level after rotation gives you a concept of bulk density. Anyway, control particle size. Let's go back up here. Bulk density can vary because of dryer design. Wheel design can change bulk density and atomization. Fluidized bed, uh, maybe bulk density may be dependent upon degree of attrition or agitation. Uh, control particle size and bulk density is tough. I mean, you, you have a dryer is to dry, and then you throw in that you want a certain particle size, and then you throw in you want a certain bulk density. So there's three or four, there's three requirements already. As a result, uh, you uh, may not be able 
to accomplish it well using one piece of equipment. Oftentimes you may control bulk density by agglomeration. Okay. Size enlargement helps determine bulk density, helps to import dissolved properties, can be accomplished in some types of dryers. I've been told incidization can only be accomplished in a fluidized bed or so they say. Yeah. Problems, all sorts of problems, problems of all sorts. Again, play what happens, games. Accident scenarios. Your procedure actually should have three or four columns to it. What you should do, number one. Number two column should be what would happen if you don't do it this way. Three, uh, what sort of accidents have happened if you don't do it that way. And then general comment and history would be the fourth column. So if I have a procedure, it's uh, certainly, most procedures are quite un unspecified. You know, quite frankly, aren't very, not followed. Anyway, fires uh, cut off the oxygen, condensation and ductwork's a problem, excessive temperatures are the problem, metal failures, problem, especially if feed's cut off. If there isn't anything to evaporate, that hot, that metal gets will get hot. So you want to avoid shutting off the feed. Feeder plugging due to agglomeration is common. Agglomeration inside the drying chamber may be common. Changes in feed and uh, airflow rates are a problem. Heater loss may be a problem. Can you imagine the losing the heater and then you have all this material in there that's all wet? Holy moly. Okay, we're gonna go into the dryers now. And this is where we, I, we left off last time. Okay, so this, uh, see what we got here. Trade dryers, material sets, low cost, high operating cost of loading and unloading, drying slow, used for valuable products that can be damaged by motion, good for small production rates, static drying condition may not be a good idea, it just sort of sits there. So to avoid that then uh, static condition, you try to pass the air through the uh, material you're trying to dry. Certainly you want to pass over. So anyway, you have drying times on hours, 12 hours, 14 hours, long time. Usually you're running into diffusional drying because you're not allowed to move the solids around that much. Okay. Evaporation rate's pretty low, right? So these are very interesting uh, data. This is essentially a performance data. And this is why you want to use uh, Wallace's book because they got all sorts of performance data. In this case, this is varying according to product rather. Since the dryer, tray dryer is fixed, and you get some idea of their performance. Okay. Material thickness on trays uh, makes it diffusional limiting the airflow rate well. You want cross flow at least. You want flow through if you can do it. Diffusion limited, limit capacity, long drying times. Trays need cleaning, unloading, loading, even possible. Okay. Conveyor dryers, material rides on the belt, uh, belt, sorry. Good idea to have a belt perforated. Belts are covered uniformly for boat drying. May not be perforated for fine powders. That's interesting, maybe uh, fine powders give you the idea that they actually flow easily, whereas indeed they may not flow easily at all. Uh, have you ever had a salt and pepper shaker, or excuse me, a, a, a shaker where you're trying to say, you're cooking and you got a jar of oregano there and it's got salt shaker type of arrangement where you're shaking the oregano onto your 
food, and the thing clogs, stops, right? So that's possible. It's flowing, and then suddenly it uh, bridges and uh, stops flowing. Uh, you need belt-wide feeders, a usual design. There's temperature zones, exposure times, minutes to four hours, right? Feed typically granular paste extruders. Solids are treated gently with little attrition. If it's sitting there, riding along there, and it doesn't experience anything negative, you can have fans that go through. I always like to ask my students, what are the differences in belt speeds here? Obviously, you have uh, the same mass in equals the mass out. So this must be moving very fast because it's very thin. And this must be moving very slowly because it's very thick. Again, you have staged systems here. You have maybe a cooling zone and a heating zone. And again, a good thing we have performance data, excellent stuff. And before we were talking about uh, hours, now we're down to minutes, 70 minutes, 16 minutes. The evaporation rate is certainly going up significantly. Different types of materials up here. Okay, problems, non-uniform feeding, drying across the belt, airflow may carry off the fines or blow off the solids. Belts must be cleaned, may require brushing, washing. Solids blow up on drier walls. You got a lot of potentially static electricity involved here. Right? Anytime when you have powder or any material moving through a pipe, for example, you have the potential of building up a static charge. So hopefully uh, you can uh, short, uh, provide grounding for all the equipment. That way you will save problems with dust explosions potentially or with stray sparks. Spark temperature is roughly around 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So that would ignite almost, ignite almost anything. So anyway, um, airflow may carry off the fines. Belts may be, must be clean, brushing or washing. Washing may require drying operation after the washing. Solids build up on the walls. Direct rotary, now this is a workhorse. I'll give you an idea of a rotary dryer. Here you go, a rotating. You have the trunnions here. You have the feed coming in or feed chute coming in. You have lifting veins. Hopefully there's a nice rain of uh, solids across the, the dryer area here. And then down here you have the discharge. And hopefully uh, the solids are flowable enough to be able to be picked up and dropped basically, so there is some attrition going on. Uh, see, where were we up here? Needed slope rotating chamber containing the material to be dried. The lowest operating costs, I don't know, maybe. Airflow can be co-current, counter-current, lifted up by flights and free fall. Desire to have an even rain across the cross section. Uh, material solids motion depends upon flight design and rotational speed. Material holdup can be as low from 9 to 15 percent loading. Now, I don't know if that's true or not either because um, you may want to push, push the amount of material through. At some point, You wind up with a sort of a ball mill, a tumbling zone in here, which may not be desirable from the point of view of drying. But I suspect if push comes to shove, 15% uh, loading may be a little low. And uh, plant tests uh, might be able to give you an upper value for this for your particular product and drying conditions.
But this, uh, this is an extremely important uh, idea here, how much you can put in. Material holdups increase for diffusional drying. The shape of the flights is compromised between drying effectiveness, ease of cleaning, angle of repose. The angle of repose is very important for solids. And if you don't, you should uh, understand the angle of repose and actually measure it continually, measure it. It could be changing on you. And then changing the angle of repose uh, could uh, give you an idea of what uh, is affecting your drying operations. Devices like internal hanging chains or scraping chains, internal external knockers may help stickier wet solids. So along here, there would be hammers. Inside, there may be chains moving around. Okay. Problems not cost effective at low capacities and low temperatures. Radiated heat loss is high at high temperatures. Noise from knockers may be unacceptable. Oh, yeah. And this thing could be hot. In which case, uh, you may insulate it. Be interesting. That would be a real challenge. You got a dryer like this and suddenly you want to insulate it. Interesting. Uh, again, different types of materials, the dryer diameter, wow, seven feet, okay. Moisture coming in at 17, leaves at seven. You have the evaporation rate now, it's very high, a lot higher than what it was. Inlet temperature, exit temperature, those are important. The residence time, nine minutes, 12 minutes. Okay. Method of feed, screw, screw, shoot. Question is, what happens when you shoot uh, clogs? Or if your shoot doesn't clog, what happens if material is retained in there and forms clunkers? Hopefully the clunkers are, uh, will pass through. Broke, it will be broken up. Flash dryers, right? Basically, uh, you have some sort of feeding here to a hammer mill, and there's a huge burst of hot air going up, and you go immediately to a cyclone that catches and backfeeds some of the product, right? And then the, you have a splitter here where you draw off product or you backfeed some of the material. And you have a screw conveyor sitting here. Uh, I'm not sure if you would worry about the mixing or not, since you have the hammer mill down here doing a substantial amount of mixing here. You'll get some mixing up here. Uh, you potentially don't like elbows here because it uh, gives you a back swirl region that lets material potentially accumulate uh you may also want to hit or vibrate this wall here maybe cyclone catches the first and then uh, there might be a bag house or scrubber or electrostatic precipitator bag house i uh, maybe you have a bag house at home it's called a vacuum sweeper basically it's kind of a nifty little device right so over here you have, again, this is from Wallace's book. Uh, you have some sort of combustion chamber for the hot air. You got some sort of feeder situation, some sort of distributor. Flash down, you have a classifier sitting here. It's a little bit of a classifier. The large particles go around and get fed back. The smaller dust particles are going down, perhaps to be fed back as well, or you pull it off as product. Then out of the uh, cyclone, you might pass it through a electrostatic precipitator. You may burn it, uh, whatever. Make sure it's clean. Lots of options there. And our product, uh, give you an idea of uh, moisture contents, right? Nil, zero, three percent. 
method of eating direct. Looks like direct, I don't know, uh, they burn up oil, huh? Wow. I wouldn't, I'd try to stick with natural gas. With burning oil, I can imagine the trash that's in oil. Uh, anyway. Well, who cares about the trash and the oil when you're dealing with chicken droppings? Anyway. And the performance data makes a comparison of the stuff. Problems, solid buildups on the wall, settle in horizontal ducts, limited by the need uh, to convey solids, only unbounded moisture removed. There's no time for diffusional drying to take place. I mean, it's over with in what, what's the residence time here? Their residence time? I guess they don't give you the residence time, but I, I suspect it's substantially small, right? Doesn't stay in there very long. Anyway, wow, look at that, 27,000 pounds per hour. That's a big one. Okay. Attrition of particles occur. Uh, Need uh, consistency allow drying without sticking. Okay, prevention of condensation limits, uh, humidity rises, lumps may be, they have to be milled. Right? So again, you have a hammer mill to take care of that. Right. If a lump, uh, lump may do, go up the tube, you may just sit there off in side corner. Anyway. Useful suggestions, use a rarity airlock feeders to reduce air leaks, and feed wet solids through an aspirating venturi. Back mixing helps, perhaps. Don't feed lumps, right, which uh, result in slugging flow. Get rid of lumps, uh, you can do a kitchen analogy. I like kitchen analogies. What you do in the kitchen actually occurs in the plant. So you have a flower sister to get rid of lumps or even the occasional uh, thing that looks like a lump. There's, there's different, different characterizations to a lump if you, if you haven't. Uh, anyway, uniform feeding. Feed can be the de, de, uh, agglomerated, right? Mill using a kicker mill or other size reducing materials. Spiral ducts increase exposure time and avoid impingement points. These things can, I understand, can be quite huge. Up, huge, three or four stories. Anyway. Uh, fluidized beds, very versatile, wide range of designs, temperatures and residence times. One of the interesting things is you can make the residence time, if you design your fluidized bed correctly, say you had a spiral baffle in your fluidized bed, you can actually specify a residence time where there's very little, there's one residence time and there's very little uh, variation in it. Okay. Can have internal heatings for drying and cooling. You can heat partitions. You can use partitions in the same unit. Airflow lifts the solids with little carryover. Well, I don't know if that's actually true or not. You minimize carryover upper chambers enlarged. Best for heat transfer drying. Can be used for uh, usual drying. Again, we up oh, overshot there. Okay, I guess I really need to use this. Okay, minimize carryover, use infusional drying. So here we have our partitions, right, and overflow weirs. 
which by the way also wear and may disappear. You have a large uh, upper chamber. Uh, you need to have very low velocities up here to catch the dust. However, dust will still go out. Here down here you have uh, uniform air feed, hot air feed here. You have an internal heater here. You have overflow weirs and internal baffles perhaps. And then you have a cool cooling chamber here. Different things. So fluidized beds, trying time minutes in there. Bulk densities. Anyway, performance, some performance data. One third pressure drop across the bed to keep the air uniformly distributed. Pressure drops a minor cost. Hmm. Maybe yes, maybe no. Baffles can, well, if you don't do the one third, then uh, you might want to figure out what gives you the best distribution in the way of pressure drop. Baffles can be used effectively. Some can be arranged to cause plug flow. That would can provide a fairly constant residence time. Minimize fines carry over an upper chamber. Air can be brought in at different temperatures. By that, I mean, you could go back here and put a baffle up here, right, a separator. The bigger material will fall back down and the very fine dust will flow around the baffle and exit, but the larger material will have a tendency to fall back. Air can be brought in at different temperatures and flow rates for different partitions. Feed is usually wet, some sticky. Rear height controls volume and residence time. Adjustable rear heights for control. Fines can be captured and returned to the bed. Fines can be captured and actually taken elsewhere and agglomerated to another product. Problems and limitations is the support screen. Volume below the screen can fill with solids. Screens can be plugged and need cleaning. Not all material can be fluidized. Solids that do not fluidize evenly. That's another type. Non-uniform gas flow through the screens. Not used for, for wet sludge materials, internal exchangers subject to fouling, particle attrition, agglomeration can occur, channeling can occur through the solids. Design variations might be a spouted bed and vibrating screens. Spray dryers, wow. I made this fantastic course on spray dryers. Uh, natural gas was 20 times more expensive than it is today, and I made this really fantastic course on spray drying. Then the price of natural gas fell greatly, and nobody wants to worry about my spray drying course anymore. <laughs> ah, such is life, hey? Eh? But anyway, spray dryers. Oh, liquid atomization of hot air, large surface area, evaporation loads are high. Now, if you look into atomization, uh, viscosities have to be below 30,000 centipoid to atomize. Energy airflow may be hot. Spray drying is used on many, many, many products, many designs. May or may not be insulated. No heat insulation keeps the walls cool. Right. Prevents sticking. Possibility of co a coffee. Evaporation of drops can be quite complex. Hollow spheres often form. Particle size increases bulk density. Since you have hollow spheres here, bulk density can go down. Evaporation can be fast or slow. The drop may form a skim, a skin, excuse me. Here's some uh, diagrams for spray dryer. Anyway, in particular, these are temperatures in here. This is air temperatures. You can see the air comes in at 200. I'm not sure if this is air or feed, but it's certainly air temperatures exposed to the feed. The feed temperature uh, remains fairly constant, whereas the air temperature drops significantly because of evaporative cooling. So, 
Here's some different materials, moisture content, spraying device, uh, flow patterns. Looks like they're all parallel. Uh, temperature ranges. All right. Uh, may not. Atomization, you're assuming drops are formed, right? And drops may not form. In fact, cotton candy is an example of atomization process where it forms uh, very fine filaments or perhaps called angel hair. And the other atomization process, another example would be party string. Problems and limitations, not all liquids and slurries can be sprayed. Just like not all sol uh, liquids and slurries can be fluidized, right? Well, slurries can't be fluidized that much. Sticky or tacky solids can build up. Uh, nozzle wear, clears, clogging, can pulse. Electrostatic charge can build up, possibly with large airflow rate. Spinning discs have limited discharge distance. Uh, single nozzles have limited capacity and versatility. Multiple nozzles are needed for high production rates. Frequent cleaning needed for nozzles. You need to add nozzle maintenance. And a shutdown may actually freeze material in the nozzle. That may not be a good idea. Viscous feed requires high temperature, high pressure, atomized. Typically, viscous feeds means that you might have to go to a air or a gas liquid atomizer. You're atomizing the liquid with air or the gas stream. Gas stream can be air, steam, CO2, nitrogen, whatever. Nozzle testing is obviously necessary. Depending upon energy input, surface tension, viscosity, spray environment. Properties can be modified with temperature and concentration. Don't usually don't want to dilute. There's a tendency when you have something thick that you dilute it so it's easy feeding. All that does is increase the problems, adding more moisture. So this is going in the wrong direction when you dilute. Uh, but you know, I suspect, you know, given the world that we live in. This is usually you don't want to dilute, except when dilution helps them. You know. For every rule, there's an exception, right? Both nozzle and rotary produce the same drop sizes, roughly. Cups and discs produce high uniformity. That's very important to recognize if you're after uniformity, and uniformity can be uh, very profitable, okay? So these are off the shelf items. The problem with high uniformity, it usually means high, uh, low flow rates. So even though you have high uniformity, you uh, have low production rates. So you just buy multiple machines and stack them. Okay, nozzles can be more economical, but may need a high pressure pump. Somewhere there's gotta be an energy source whether it's a high-speed rotary disc or a pump, it doesn't matter. It's got to be some sort of discs and wheels can be used in all applications. You have abrasive feeds, you have uniformity requirements, high capacity, doesn't plug, no pressure, high pressure pumps. Speeds up to 90,000 RPM. High-speed motors are often needed. This sort of RPM requires skilled maintenance, probably a wheel right and these accurate balancing. Uh, generally, wheels and discs are more versatile than nozzles. Disadvantages of spray dried particles they're small, low bulk density dust, slow to disperse in liquids. Spray drying is often followed by a fluidized bed. Great combination for instantization. Some questions here for you. Let's move on. This is after dryer considerations. You all got the working process now. We got to worry about what you do afterwards. Needed for some dryers, not others. So needed for fluid ice bed spray dryer, flash dryers. Needed for particle recovery. Uh, needed uh, for solvent recovery. Needed for any dryer with solid air mixtures. Right. 
product collector where there's substantial particle carryover. Product collectors, uh, good idea is just settling chamber. Uh, gravity, just have a large chamber, it settles in there and the air moves on. Uh, cyclone, wet scrubbers, uh, bag houses, and electrostatic precipitators, so it's not mentioned there. Sure, complete collection, possibly separated into fractions. Going back here, there's another thing as well. You can burn it. You can take the gas stream and uh, any particulates in there. You have it pass through a flame and burn it up. Any obnoxious gases, you might pass through a flame and burn it up. So this would be uh, product collectors, whereas I guess burning a burner or uh, what would be not necessarily a collector. Anyway, a sure uh, complete recovery and possible separating flack. Usually you have cyclones and bag houses, cyclones and wet scrubbers. Scrubber design, numerous, diverse, collection of fines and course, need attention. Safety is paramount. Fires and explosions are more likely to occur in collectors than dryers. It's interesting. Powder buildup can cause dust explosions. Um, which gives me an idea here. I'm not. What you take your vacuum sweeper and take the collected material in your vacuum sweeper or out of your clothes dryer, take it in your backyard and see if it burns. Right. It probably doesn't burn very well. Grounding is very important to prevent sparks, explosion, safety equipment necessary. Regular cleaning is necessary. Okay. Design for cleaning and design for inspection. Void right. condensation and ducts for insulation. Too rapid a shutdown, low outlet temperatures cause condensation. Collection efficiency, uh, prediction of efficiency is difficult at best. And function of velocity, particle size, surface nature, size reduction, density, concentration, leaks and solid loading, determination by testing. So you have this bag house. Uh, so question is, is how good is your bag house? And what can you do to improve the uh, collection efficiency of your bag house? Or how often do you clean your bag house? Right. So a lot of that is operational information coming from experience. And experience may be, be come from the manufacturer, although that's not necessarily guaranteed. Right. Determination by testing. Uh, typically, you take a young engineer and you give them the assignment, hey, tell me something I don't know about that bag house. Leaks have a significant effect. And again, designed for easy cleaning, designed for easy unplugging. Okay. Settling, basically, that's not a problem. Uh, internal cyclone effect may occur. You might want to have a comb bottom. Obvious collection methods. Of course, out the bottom cyclones. Inexpensive, occupies little space. Basically, low collection efficiency. The cut is poor. Well, I mean, cyclones is an empty piece of equipment. I mean, there's nothing in there. There's no moving parts. All you're doing. So uh, when it says collect efficiency is poor, well, you know, 90% ain't that bad. That's, that's the worst of the worst right there. Cut is poor. Well, that's true. Right. Anyway, since they're, they're not very complicated and they're real cheap, and uh, so you go with it. Efficiency depends upon pressure drop. No pressure drop, no efficiency. Easy cleaning, low maintenance, handles abrasive high temperatures, efficiencies are limited by air velocities that are limited by abrasion. Abrasion starts to occur around 30 feet a second for solids and gas stream. 
But actually, the real abrasion starts to occur around 60 feet a second. So I don't uh, know. Of course, then again, you put in a wear liner or wear plates, and that can get you around that problem. Efficiency declines as diameter increases. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, used in parallel are batteries of cyclones. Uniform feed helps. Distribution of the spiral needs to be convenient and smooth with no obstructions. Efficiency is reduced by air leaks, warps, and dents in the geometry. Bag houses, scrubbers usually follow. Leaks can be minimized, okay, if identified, if a rotary lock feeder is used, screw conveyor, spring loaded feed, all right, it's used. Double flap tipping valve. I've got to figure out what that thing looks like. <clears throat> bag houses, uh, many large bag filters, like your vacuum sweeper at home. These filter the air, usually large surface area, woven or unwoven. Cleaning is an issue. Cleaning in place by mechanical shaking or air reversal or pulsing. Articles are dislodged. Fabrics or media are chosen for temperature wear resistant filtration problem properties. It is filtering solids from the air. Modular construction reduced costs. Uh, cyclones come first, then the bag. Cyclones reduces uh, bag abrasion and also powder loading. Backup scrubber may be needed to, in the eventual bag rupture. Right. Now the real question is what causes a bag rupture? At some point, you have a bag in there and something rips it. What caused the rip? Bag filtration, this C, depends upon coating of solids on the bag, varies with powder characteristics. Coarse particles may be needed for proper filtration. If you have coarse particles there, uh, it prevents a buildup of the fine particles and provides uh, spaces for the air to flow through. Typically, you're looking at pressure drop for uh, five inches water gauge. Excessive pressure drops may bind, uh, blind or blind. There's the same words in there. Uh, fabric requiring cleaning, cleaning by bag removal. All right, sonic vibrations. When you have your vacuum sweeper at home, do you throw away the bag or do you empty the bag and then reuse it? Uh, usual designs given four cubic feet per minute, one foot square cloth area. Do you have this information for your bags? Uh, bags are heavy, give heavy failures. Bag clamps is often the case. Fabric, also fa failure of the fabric. I mean, your bag house may be 50 years old and the fabric's rot, has rotted, you know. Hopefully you're not that situation, 50 year old bag houses. Drop in pressure indicates breakage, so you monitor the pressure. You also have such devices as uh, the uh, tribal flow uh, particle detector, kind of cool. Okay, material collected in bags may not be desirable as a product. Recycle reprocessing may be necessary though. Scrubbers, yields a slurry that then has to be filtered. Okay, common designs for interior impingement plate, high efficiency, high pressure drop, low cost, absorbs as noxious and condenses moisture. Operating conditions, uh, most dryers operate below atmospheric pressure to avoid uh, powder leaks. Feed uh, solids content fluctuate, can fluctuate 15%. I consider monitoring your solids feed. Air supply is usually ambient, no preconditioning, but it may be filtered. Higher inlet uh, moisture causes high, higher outlet moisture and higher outlet temperatures. So there may be a significant difference between summer and winter. Winter being a low moisture inlet air. Wide swings in inlet temperature and humidity affects powder and the weather extremes should be included in the design. 
size heaters on the lowest expense, uh, expected temperature, size blowers for the lowest temp, uh, low, coldest weather. Leaks and losses, well insulated, 0.1 to 1% on heat, greater for larger areas and higher temperatures. Insulation is 95%. Well insulated, you may be down here. Uninsulated, you may be there. Operating pressure has little effect on that. Air leaks are always present. And burning fuel adds moisture. It should be calculated. Fuel and other hot waste gases are often too high and moisture content to use for drying. All right. You could potentially use it as indirect dryers of course if you have a hot waste stream you could have it stay on one side of a metal wall and use it for drying uh what is it pinch technology concept there uh condensation can be frustrating can frustrate continuous operations so you have drainage ports and spot heaters i was mentioning spot heaters before but drainage ports are also possible Product and exit temperatures are difficult to determine. It's kind of interesting. Heats of crystallization, freezing, hydration effects of heat solution reaction can have significant effects. Adding heat to the system other than air helps. Heating the feed reduces heat load and airflow rate lows for allows for lower inlet air temperatures. Negative heating addition can have an opposite effects. Positive heats of solution. Increase heat loads. Unintended leaks are hard to determine. They can be anywhere from joints, feed point, product exit, especially joints. Inlet air moisture is seldom measured. Excuse me. Outlet dryer moisture is seldom measured. Uh, or shall we say, is seldom measured well. Determine dust loading on equipment. What's the loading on your cyclone? What's the loading on your bag houses? What's the loader loading on your scrubbers? Oh, Proving operations, cost savings are likely. Many operations are inefficient. Improvements can be made. Energy savings, product increase. Well, energy savings depends upon how much energy you use, right? Possible improvements, uh, reduce feed moisture. That's the most effective. Remember, you really don't want to dry. <laughs> Reduce or recover heat losses. Well, it's possible. Provide heat from other than the airstream additional secondary dryer, new controls and different operations. Order of importance, ballpark numbers. These are coming out of uh, Cook and Dumont. Reduce feed moisture by 1%, 15 improvement in fuel savings. Reduce air temperature, inlet air temperature minus, say, 5 degrees. Uh, excuse me, reduce outlet air temperature, you might say 14% of fuel. Increase air temperature by 10 degrees, might save 10% in fuel. 10% in fuel, again, fuel. Increase insulation, reduce the leakage, increase feed temperature. Look at that. Increasing feed temperature, that means you don't have to heat it as much. You heat it somewhere else. In other words, you don't want to cool. You don't want to cool your feed. You want to heat, dry your feed while it's hot, right? If you haven't noticed, for example, out of a crusher or grinder operation, you have this powder. Because it received a significant amounts of energy going through the crusher or grinder, then you turn around and try to dry it. The drying is significantly improved because mechanical crushing and grinding the powder is highly inefficient. Lots of the energy leaves with the product stream and crusher. So you don't want to cool down the powder when you're going to turn around and dry it. Rethink solid liquid separation. There, besides drying, there's filtration, acidification, decantation, which is another simple drainage. Decantation is really inexpensive. Drainage is really inexpensive. Drying is very expensive. Avoid drying. 
Uh, effective equipment, one piece of equipment uh, does not do it all. Two-stage drying is really great. Higher capital cost, but better performance, right? Internal heat exchangers, 40% energy savings. Use of internal heater, possible heat's added independent of the airstream. Make sure the heater is submerged. You don't want the heat to go to the air, right? You want the heat to go to the solids. Airflow rate can be reduced. Can be used for fluidization, carry off moisture. May be limited by the effects of air. Fluidization may be limited by space. Other ideas, make improvements on a gradual evolutionary basis. Keep records, <laughs> keep records, yes. Keep records, yes. Have a brief summary. Actually, you'll find that the plant historian is an extremely important person. Don't dry below moisture level required. Don't give a better product than necessary. Watch out for condensation. Preheating helps in atomization. Don't cool the feed. Multi-stage drying, as I said earlier, is a good idea. Right. Easy to justify with large capacities. One dryer handles one set of operating conditions. The other dryer handles another set of operating conditions. Better quality coming out justifies justified by product behavior, material has usually two drying rates, fast and slow, dryers match these rates. Spray dryer for fast, uh, fluid bed for, uh, with a belt dryer would be for slow, well, wait a minute, spray dryer with a fluidized bed or fluidized bed with a belt dryer. Fluidized bed's the quickie and the belt dryer would be the slow person for diffusional drying. One dryer handles the sticky stuff and the other handles the final moisture. I mentioned playing what happens games, prevent the problems from occurring, use other heat sources besides electrical heaters, potentially have heat lamps, wet back mix systems are needed, change the solvent. If you have a solvent system, right, you want to probably recapture the solvent. So you're going from water to solvent or from solvent to water. Water is expensive because of its high latent heat. You can get the right tool for the job, pick the right type of dryer. No, buy, no one dryer does it all, testing, testing, testing. Determine what's wrong, what to do about it. The easy when problems identified, more difficult when the problem is not. Most common reasons, mechanical breakdown, fires, product buildup, right? Condensation, deteriorating performance and wear, low production rates, reduced product quality, reduction in product quality, change in primary properties. That's a real kicker. You have a feed. You don't monitor your feed, so you don't know what you're actually getting. It's been the same feed for the last couple of years, and suddenly your suppliers or your process upstream suddenly changes, and now you have a new feed. Nobody told you it was going to be new feed. Surprise, surprise. You know how well companies communicate. Actually, I've been into some companies where <laughs> there seems to be no communication whatsoever. After 30 years, one plant talks to another plant. I find it unbelievable how little sharing there is in industry. Change in primary property, secondary property. Anyway, troubleshooting, uh, get familiar with the situation, review process history. Go somewhere else that's using your dryer, see what sort of problems they've had. If you're in the food industry, the pharmaceutical people may, want, may, may talk to you or vice versa. What has changed with safety conditions? Yeah, that's a biggie. What has changed? Something's changed. What was the past doing? Again, the historian concept here. Get familiar with the situation. As the dryer becomes less safe, has the dryer become less safe? What are the actual operating procedures? What the person actually does or what the operators actually do has not been written down probably. Differences in first, second, and third shifts. What are they supposed to be? 
discuss problems with the operators, supervisors, and indeed the third shift. The third shift to me is impressed in the fact that you even show up at 3 a.m. in the morning. When did the problem start? Uh, it's been tolerated for some time. It suddenly happened, right? What's interesting is some problems are simply tolerated. I've not, they've got a bad working piece of equipment. They've been living with it for the last 10 years. That's amazing. Dryers change with time. It's not constant. Systematic approach may be necessary. The whole system may need study. Typical topics under troubleshooting, uh, equipment performance, filing condensation, leaks, evaporative rates, product quality, collector efficiency, condensation, low production rates. Anyway, this is a list uh, of different dryers and their capabilities. Right? This is the uh, legend that explains what the B's and the R's and the S's and the T's stand for up there. This list is provided to you by, from, by Cook and Dumont. I don't claim this, just passing it all to you all. Anyway, uh, conclusions close out. The close out number of dryers are out there. There's 50 or 100 identifiable types, and there's variations on those, I assure you. Make sure you know what you want. Process objectives are very important. Behind every dryer, there's a material handling problem. Dryer selection often depends upon concern, uh, concerns other than drying. Anyway, I'm gonna stop there. I hope you enjoyed this. Happy drying to you. And again, Cook and Dumont, excellent book. I'm not sure if they're still around. Uh, and again, Wallace's book, not necessarily the 2005 book, but the earlier edition. And I recommend YouTube up, uh, YouTube really good uh, for understanding things. Uh, this is not my phone number. However, my email is still active. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this uh, lecture on drying. And I hope... Uh, you don't have any problems. Anyway, we'll stop now. Let's see if